if this is what your steady diet of, of, of content comes from, it's no wonder, it's no wonder why our entire community has been lulled to sleep because we love the collective and we are married to the culture. And it does not matter how toxic, how destructive it is, the thought of being put out of the community, that cost, that price is too much. Some of us are unwilling to pay it. But you know what? Listen, what I gained by abandoning the prevailing narrative and, the, and, and, and what everybody else was saying, you got to stay on code and you got to believe this. Why? Just because you're black. One of the best things that I did in my entire life. I no longer vet who I'm going to be friends with or who I'm going to conduct business with or who I'm just going to talk to on the basis of their ethnicity. I don't view the world that way anymore. Am I, am I actually immune to a, a, a racist attack? Of course not. I know racism when I legitimately experience it and I can call it out when it is actually happening. But many of us just need to be honest in your day-to-day -day life. The boogeyman or the white man that you're trying to paint, he's, he or she is not affecting you, your life, and your choices. Nowhere near to the level that you idolize and place them on. You need to deal with your own inferiority. I had to be honest and recognize that whenever I would walk in a room and the whole room was full of white people, I brought that inferior, that inferior negative energy to the room. They didn't make me feel that way. I walked in there like, oh, well, this bunch of white people. I'm the only black person. They probably think, you know, I'm this. And they thinking this about me. And I know they racist. I brought all of that in. And then nobody say nothing to me other than, hey, how you doing? Welcome. Have a seat. Here's your name tag. I'm thinking all these things, all these things off the rip. Before I've had any sort of meaningful dialogue or engagement with these people, because I already came with preconceived notions that I've inherited and internalized from the urban talk radio experience. It, it, I'm telling you, this is, this is legitimately a fact. I had to detoxify from that. Because when my husband and I entered the industry that we in, when we chose to start a business, you know the people that helped us the most. You know the people that were like, if you need anything, call me. I'm a phone call away. Send me a text. You know what worked when we started our business? This, that, and the third. Y'all try that to see if that works for you. Let me know if it works. Call me. Email me. They did not share the same melanin count as me. They didn't. They just were genuinely helping because we had something in common. We were in the same industry, and they remembered what it was like to just be starting out with a hope and a dream to want to have a business that they could pass to their family. And they saw that in me and my husband. And they were like, that's a lovely couple. Have you met the Chapmans? Oh, they were so nice. And let me, it, it was just, we were equal. We were image bearers in the sight of God, and that's how they viewed me. But I didn't get to that point by continuing to infect my life and my ear gate and my eyes to the poison that was coming through the pipe from the urban talk radio community. That's the point I'm trying to drive home. These black Democrats, you heard what Nathan Daly said. A mayor told him, all I got to do, all I got to do they say that my opponent, who happens to have an R behind their name, all I got to do is call them racist, and black people believe it. They don't even have to have been guilty and done anything. You just say it. That's all you got to do. It's like saying, that should tell us something, because you know it's true. You know all they got to do is say, yeah, he's racist. And you'd be like, yeah, he's racist. And then when someone asks you, well, what did he do? Or what did he say that was racist? I don't know, but I just, I heard him say it. So, you know, we never have a sufficient answer. Or if we do have an answer, it's an answer that's taken out of context. Like there are black people that still walk around thinking Donald Trump is just this white supremacist racist. They, they can't tell you on what basis he's racist, but they believe it. And even if there's a circumstance involving him 
and a person of color, they are automatically assume that it is is it's based on some ethnic partiality, not because the person's just stupid. They automatically assume that whatever tension they must be having with the person, it must be on the basis of ethnicity. It can't possibly be because the person made a bad decision or they said something that was dumb. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I I believed and I wholeheartedly felt that I needed, I needed, I actually believed with all that was in me that I needed to stay with the group and I needed to be ethnically loyal to my people for no other reason that we shared the same melanin. We were on the same melanin spectrum. It didn't matter that what they were promoting was wicked. It didn't matter that they were promoting evil things that were against human flourishing. It did not matter that economically it did not make sense and that it was against my own self-interest. None of those things matter. None of those things even came up in the conversation. I was simply doing what I was told because for five days out of every week, probably within 52 weeks out of the year, I was listening to urban apologists who were only interested in steering my brain toward a particular narrative. And I was taught and I was trained to never question because these are the people that are, you know, supporting us and they really care about us and they want what's best for us. So, of course, they're only going to give me what is best for me. I don't need to question what they're saying because, well, why would they steer me wrong? Like, they're on the radio. They must have some credibility. These are the things, looking back, that I thought about, and this was just the way I thought. And so now, this side of salvation, being a 44-year-old woman still living in Atlanta, it all makes sense to me now why shows like The Breakfast Club have such a large audience and why people listen to them. A lot of times it's because, one, they haven't heard the opposing viewpoint and they haven't been allowed to charitably engage with the opposing viewpoint or disagree with it because all they hear is one side because their their ears are locked and loaded to urban radio stations that are wholly committed to promoting what the culture says is right. It doesn't matter that the culture is exhibiting moral uh, depravity. It doesn't matter that the culture is promoting and supporting things that are going to be detrimental to us as a people. None of that matters. All I know is that I was listening to who the trusted leaders were in the community and what they said was Bible. And even if I did on some level disagree with it, I didn't care enough about it to really disagree and to push back and to change my mind. You're just going through the motions. You're going day in and day out. You're listening to this indoctrination and then you believe it. I am convinced. I am convinced that a lot of urban talk radio is done strategically by design to not promote the flourishing of the black community, but designed to keep us down, not systematically. I don't, I don't want to borrow from their language and say it's systematic racism. But what it is, is that there is this intricate web of black elites who hold positions in media, hold positions of power and media, and they are very crafty by making sure that they only craft the messaging that stays on code with what the Democratic Party wants. And that is to be Marxist and socialistic in theory, to promote divisions amongst American people by way of ethnicity, and then to further segment us down some more and separate us by gender, and then drill us down some more and separate us by sexual identity.